The word bipartisan usually means some larger than usual deception is being carried out. But the United States has taken lethal, targeted action against Al-Qaeda and its associated forces with remotely piloted aircraft commonly referred to as drones. At my direction, the United States military successfully executed a flawless precision strike that killed the number one terrorist anywhere in the world. We, we had to pass a FISA bill in order to protect and defend the American people. Last night, the Senate voted to advance the House pass FISA bill, a system we would soon have to rely upon to keep our country safe. Family Joe Biden and his wife used a loophole that the Obama-Biden administration wanted to get rid of to avoid paying about $500,000 in taxes on his millions of dollars of speech and book income. Did you use that $916 million loss to avoid paying personal federal income taxes? For of course I do. Of course I do. Banned assault weapons now. Ban them now. Take the firearms first and then go to court. Uh, I like taking the guns early. Like Were I a Jew, I would be a Zionist. And my father pointed out to me, I did not need to be a Jew to be a Zionist. For I am. The Jewish state has never had a better friend in the White House than your president, Donald J. Trump. To our friends in Ukraine, America will soon deliver more ammunition and air defense to give weapons to Ukraine. This would not have passed without Donald Trump. Go get vaccinated, America. Go and get the vaccination. I recommend take the vaccines. I did it. It's good. Take the vaccines. This is the most important election in the history of our country. It's going to be the most important election this country has undergone. Believe the election that just occurred, quote, was rigged. The process was rigged. Tip the scales of an election to functionally favor the Democrat Party. What Donald Trump is attempting to do, rig the election. This is, I think, going to be the most important election that we've ever had. This is the most important election you've ever voted in your entire life. What do you, what do you say to voters who are upset that those are the two choices? Get over yourself. Those are the two choices. Yeah. Yeah. So get out there and vote. Get out there vote, and vote. Which is a good well, that's what this is really about. Mark Twain famously said, if voting made a difference, they wouldn't let us do it. And there's a lot of truth to that. In the past 20 years, since the dawning of the new millennia, every president has had the same policy on the economy, spending, military, jobs, immigration, foreign policy, surveillance, corporate welfare, and the Constitution. You know, the little things. This changing of the guard, but never changing the way business is done has created something now known as the Uniparty. This Uniparty has convinced the American public that we live in the world's most fair form of government, democracy, with our two-party system. This is in comparison to the absolute worst form of government, known as fascism which only has one choice for a leader. But America has two choices for a leader. One more whole choice than the absolute worst shit you can imagine. That's the con. The Uniparty, the big boys that, that really try to run the show. There's only one party. The Uniparty. Oh, the Uniparty. Our Uniparty. We have a Uniparty. A, a Uniparty. Two wings of the same bird. And they're always trying to convince you to be scared of the other one to support this one. Because if you do that, you never. when you get furious at one side, you vote them out and put the other side in. But the other side's all part, it's all part of the same fucking thing. And what's the system for creating this democratic utopia? Why, it's the Electoral College. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
this November, you gotta get out and vote. It's all about democracy, y'all. Your vote gets counted with the rest of the votes in the country and then gets sent off to the Electoral College. What's that? The Electoral College are a bunch of officials who do the voting for us. So in case we elect the wrong person, they can fix that shit. Whoa, 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 hold up. Who the hell are these people? Well, no one knows for sure, but whoever they is, they the folks who actually do the real voting after we do our pretend vote. Yeah! Pop to the Hold the f*** on! You're telling me our votes don't matter? Our votes are like suggestions. So this November, we should... Yeah! Dump the vote! The Electoral College is comprised of 530 electors based on state population, each state's two senators, and superdelegates comprised of House speakers and former presidents, which decide the presidency every four years. It takes a total of 270 votes to decide the presidency. The popular vote is the fake vote that U.S. citizens cosplay in every four years. And the Electoral College corrects our vote if they decide we don't know what's good for ourselves. So how do we get here? The Electoral College was created nearly 250 years ago, where there was practically no press or newspapers. So the Founding Fathers thought that having Electoral College middlemen in each state who were well informed on the reputations of people in Washington would cast a vote in the best interest of that state's people. Because people didn't exactly stay informed 250 years ago. Many couldn't even read a newspaper all that well to begin with. But the system didn't age well when corporate media came into existence in the 20th century. This popular vote versus electoral vote system was transformed by corporate media, it was very much in bed with the CIA and the state as a whole, as was revealed in the 1979 church committee hearings. Today, the ruling class use their relationships with corporate media giants and the infiltration of media by intelligence agencies to brainwash the public into picking who the president will be. That hopefully will align with the electoral college choice that is to be expected every four years. This media brainwashing every election cycle allows U.S. citizens to feel like they are choosing their leader. World famous linguist Noam Chomsky plotted out and alerted the public to the existence of this brainwashing machine with his blockbuster book, Manufacturing of Consent, which later became a blockbuster documentary as well. People who are awake to ruling class manipulation today owe their awakening to the academic bravery and library of books written by Noam Chomsky. Chomsky pointed out in detail how this multi-trillion dollar state and corporate media machine is used to manufacture ideas in the minds of the American public. Getting us all not only to accept things that are against our own interest, but in many cases, demand them. This journey from what the public accepts to getting them to embrace things not in their own interest is called moving the Overton window. This machine Chomsky blew the whistle on turns the popular vote into a goalpost that state loyal corporate propagandists spend billions each election cycle to manipulate the American people into. By the time the election cycle has ended, a majority of Americans feel like they chose the president. And it reinforces the dogma that the system still works for the people. But sometimes, that always doesn't go to plan. And so the Electoral College will sometimes correct our choice if that goalpost isn't met. Voting now is more like a cult recruitment exercise to make the people feel like the system works. 
most likely to calm any ideas of rebellion and secession. If people feel like they picked the poison, they're less likely to complain when the side effects hit. There's a reason for this. There's a reason education sucks, and it's the same reason that it will never, ever, ever be fixed. It's never going to get any better. Don't look for it. Be happy with what you got. Because the owners of this country don't want that. I'm talking about the real owners now. The real owners, the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own all the important land. They own and control the corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Senate, the Congress, the state houses, the city halls. They got the judges in their back pockets. And they own all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They got you by the balls. They, they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying, <laughs> lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everybody else. But I'll tell you what they don't want. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interest. This phone right. is my wife's. We think Facebook is listening to us and then putting in suggested ads. So we're going to do a test here. We're going to talk about cat food because we don't have any cats we never search for cats especially cat food so let's find out because I could use some cat food well the cat is almost out of food so we might need some cat food we should buy some cat food I should call somebody and ask if they know where to get cat food and there you have it cat food this is the most insane example of how everyone is experiencing completely different social medias at the exact same time like this video my boyfriend said he'd be over by three after golfing and like it's just her every half an hour taking a video saying oh he's still not here and it gets to like 5 or 6 p.m and he's still not here okay i opened the comments of this video and kind of as i expected everyone was saying oh that's really rude it's the disregard of her time i don't like him um did he communicate with you if not then that's a red flag okay Fair enough, you know. I send this video to my boyfriend who was sat next to me and then I said to my boyfriend, lol, look at the comments. Bear in mind these comments were coming up at the top of the list, so as soon as you open the comments these are the ones that came up for me. Tell me fucking why my boyfriend opens the comments on his phone, that again it's the first list of comments that come up, it's the same time, on the same video, or you could get your own hobby instead of waiting around for him. Like god forbid he has a good time, he meant before 3am, he's ahead of schedule. No fucking wonder we're all so divided when you can look at the same comments on the same video and it'll change them based on who you are and I presume based on like other activity in the app. Like, because people look at the fucking comments of a video to gain perspective and see how everyone feels about that video. Like I do that, I think everyone does that. So if we're looking at it from two completely different angles and the only thing that i can assume really that's that different about our interactions with instagram is that he's a guy and i'm a girl and so obviously these are all like on his side and all of mine were on her side what also in this specific situation in like any of these situations it doesn't necessarily matter which party is actually in the right what matters is the fact that people are being fed completely different takes on media and like, I tried to scroll to find the comments that were on his, and I couldn't find them. So by now we know technology is listening to us, to sell the shit we don't need. Alright, so my phone is completely off. Now watch this. Hey Siri. It's, it literally turned on from being off. Meaning that it's listening to you actively when you're just having conversations and this is in your pocket. But what if something larger has been at play for a lot longer? and for a lot more higher stakes than just cat food. Big question, which is who runs the world? Technology companies increasingly determine our identities. When I was growing up, it's nature and nurture. But today, 
Our identities are determined by nature and nurture and algorithm. If, if you want to challenge the system, you can't just question authority, as we were all told when we were growing up. Today, you have to question the algorithm. And that is a staggering amount of power in the hands of these technology companies. What are they going to do with that power? These big tech platforms then sell every minute detail about your life in large data dumps to political behavioral manipulation firms to create a worst case scenario that goes beyond manufacturing your consent. Using AI to turn the media manipulation nightmare outlined by Noam Chomsky into a hyper-personalized psyop dystopia that guarantees it will get what it wants. Politicians now famously build their campaigns on data obtained from brokers. Both parties regularly boast about how much they use data. And in fact, just listen to former RNC chair Reince Priebus openly bragging about it. Everything about almost every potential voter in Georgia is known, and it's not even a joke. They, they know what beer they drink, what car they drive, how many kids they have, and all that data is used to target every single voter in Georgia. It's true. Politicians rely on data to be able to target our interests with pinpoint precision. They collect your personal information and then resell or share it with others. As one expert puts it, they're the middlemen of surveillance capitalism. So here's how surveillance capitalism works, just in brief. <laughs> you know, it begins with <coughs> these companies claiming, unilaterally claiming, our private human experience as their free source of raw material. So what do they do with that raw material? They lift out of it the rich predictive signals in our behavior, our products that predict our behavior. They are computational products mm -hmm. that predict what we will do soon and later. And they're not, even though they are about us, they're not for us. They're not sold to us. They're not meant to enhance our own lives. They're sold to business customers who want a, a leg up on what we're going to do in the future. So here's an example. Uh, we know that, for example, right now in London, there's a lot of discussion about the CCTV cameras everywhere who are taking everybody's faces without their knowledge, therefore without their permission and so on. And there, there's a lot of controversy about this. The tech companies can take your face. Why do they want your face so badly? Well, first of all, obviously, it's very important to know who's doing what and where they're going and where they are and, and so forth. But there are even deeper reasons. There are many, many muscles in the face, and those muscles can combine into hundreds of different kinds of gestures. They do facial recognition analysis to compute those gestures because those gestures predict emotion. And once they know what you're feeling, that becomes one of the most powerful predictors of your behavior. Now, that kind of behavioral insight is sold to business customers. So, for example, we know about a Facebook document that was leaked to the press in Australia written by Facebook executives to their Australian and New Zealand business customers. And what do they sell them in this document? They say, we have so much detailed data on behavior and emotion from 6.4 million young teenage and young adult people who live in New Zealand and Australia. And through this intense depth and range of data, we know their emotional cycles through every day and through the weeks, literally since the year 2008, 2009, 2010, where these kinds of um, data capture, data analysis, translating into emotional and behavioral insights that predict future behavior. One of the things that surveillance capitalists learned is that the most powerful predictions of human behavior come from actually intervening in our behavior, 
touching our behavior, to nudge, to influence, to tune, to herd our behavior toward its commercial outcomes. And what this has done is made them take hold of the digital milieu, all of the devices, beginning with our phones and our laptops, but the sensors, the facial recognition, the smart dishwasher, the smart television set, the smart car, the smart city, all of this digital infrastructure now has been taken by surveillance capitalism as a way to nudge and tune and herd our behavior toward its guaranteed outcomes. It does this with subliminal cues. It's a highly scientific process. It does this in ways that it brags about are always outside of our awareness so that we have no right of combat, we cannot resist, we cannot say no, and we cannot exit. Facebook is a pioneer surveillance capitalist. Essentially, 97% of Facebook's revenues come from its online targeted advertising markets, which are wholly owned and operated in this surveillance capitalist economic logic. So Cambridge Analytica is a parasite on the host of surveillance capitalism. All of its mechanisms and methods, all of its data, all derive from surveillance capitalism, simply pivoting those operations a few degrees from trying to acquire guaranteed commercial outcomes, achieving mm -hmm. guaranteed commercial outcomes for business customers to instead trying to achieve guaranteed political, political outcomes, outcomes yeah. for a political customer, if mm -hmm. you will, in this case, a secretive software billionaire mm -hmm. who owned that company and was using it to manipulate the public for his political aim. Dr. Zuboff not only showed that this behavioral manipulation AI is a highly scientific process that is practically impossible not to be under the spell of, but another researcher, Robert Epstein, was able to prove it with hard data. And just how effective it is at swaying elections is mind-boggling. What extraordinary times we're living in, where reality appears to be curated to an enormous degree. How do you manage reality? How do you manage perception? How do you manage information? Joining me now is Dr. Robert Epstein, a former Harvard psychology professor, author of 15 books, and current director of the American Institute for Behavioral Research and Technology. Thank you very much for joining us today, Doctor. My pleasure. One of the claims uh, that you have made that is most astonishing, difficult almost to believe, is that Google are essentially able to curate and control reality. Google that we all use as an ordinary tool in most people's lives, you claim can be used to drive and direct an agenda, that it can be used as a political tool and even weapon. In particular, I'd like to ask you about your claim that Google was able to direct six million extra votes to Joe Biden and how on earth Google would be able to do that. Well, I've been doing very rigorous scientific research on this topic for more than 11 years. And what should really shock you here is that people's preoccupation with election fraud and ballot stuffing and all that, that preoccupation, that obsession is actually engineered by Google and to a lesser extent other tech companies. By the year 2015, uh, Google alone was determining the outcomes of upwards of 25% of the national elections in the world. How do we know this? Well, in 2020, for example, uh, we had uh, 1,735 field agents in four swing states in the US, that's where the action is. What does that mean? That means that we had recruited registered voters, equipped them with special software so that we could look over their shoulders as they're getting content from Google and other tech companies. And we recorded all that content. In other words, we were seeing the real content that they're sending to real voters uh, during the days leading up to an election. And then we measured the bias in that content. We found extreme political bias uh, favoring Joe Biden, whom I actually supported, although I no longer do. The point is we found extreme political bias and we know from randomized controlled experiments, we've been 
been conducting since 2013, that that level of bias shifted at least six million votes to Biden in that election. In 2022, they shifted millions of votes in hundreds of midterm elections throughout the US. We know they did this for Brexit, by the way, in the UK. Uh, and again, they're very good at redirecting attention. What we're doing now is much, much bigger. We decided to build a permanent monitoring system in all 50 US states. At this moment in time, we have 11,638 field agents in all 50 states, which means 24 hours a day, we are monitoring and preserving and archiving ephemeral content. That's what they use to manipulate us. These companies have enormous power to determine what people see and what people don't see. And what we measure in our experiments is how that impacts people's opinions and people's the votes, the, their voting preferences. That's what we measure in controlled experiments. We present at scientific meetings. We publish in peer reviewed journals. Uh, our work follows the very highest standards of scientific integrity. And the problem here is that we're up against the most powerful mind control machine that's ever been uh, developed by humankind. And it's operating in every country in the world except mainland China. And it impacts, you know, how people see those companies. They're, they're impacting not just our elections. They're not just indoctrinating our kids. They're literally altering the way we perceive them as a company. And that's extremely dangerous. And most of these manipulations that they have access to now that they control exclusively because they're a monopoly, most of these manipulations cannot be seen by the people who are being manipulated. That makes it even more dangerous. Shoshana Zuboff's book blew the whistle on big tech, using AI powered mass behavioral manipulation to guarantee election results. But Harvard behavioralist Robert Epstein was able to prove with hard data at a congressional hearing this was happening. And proving that costed him dearly. Well, in 2019, um, one of the things I did around, around the same time I did the testimony is I did a, a private briefing for uh, state attorneys general. And uh, so I did my thing and I, you know, I can scare people um, pretty well with my, my data. We haven't got to my monitoring uh, projects yet, but we will. Okay. But I, I, so I, you know, I did my thing. And then I went out into the, uh, the kind of the waiting room there and just waited because I was done. And they started filing out and one of them came up to me. I know exactly who it was. I know what state he was from. And he says, uh, Dr. Epstein, I, I, I hate to tell you this, but he said, I think you're going to die in an accident uh, within the next few months. And then he walked away. Now, I did not die in an accident in the next few months, but my wife did. Really? Yeah. So when this person said that to you, what what does this person do? What? He's an attorney general of a state. And why did he say that to you? Because he was concerned. He thought I was pissing people off who had a lot of power and that um, they wouldn't like that. Not only is the Uniparty prepared to eliminate threats to this mass brainwashing AI, but they also gaslight the public into believing there is no alternative to the Uniparty. Get over yourself. Those are the two choices. Yeah, yeah. I love that. Right? And, yeah, and good. you know. When a non uniparty candidate attempts to challenge this duo fascist control, they are marginalized and kept out of the public eye, preventing their policies from gaining attention, which can enhance American lives. This manipulation undermines the core idea that the U.S. president serves the people and ensures these potential candidates are excluded from debate stages. Are you gonna get on the debate stage with these two guys? And if you do, what's the strategy? Well, there's no compulsory debate. President, Biden, President Trump has challenged President Biden to debate, which I think is a good thing. Um, the, the debates are scheduled. There's three debates that are scheduled beginning on September 18th. 
I should have a spot in those debates because my polling up till now has has been has beat those metrics. Now another poll today shows someone doing much better than you might think. So take a look at this 2024 election. This is if RFK Jr. is in the mix. 33% Biden, 35% Trump. 24% Kennedy. He is the highest polling independent in decades and could potentially take millions of votes from either candidate. 22% in one poll, 24% in another. That is the kind of numbers we haven't seen since Ross Perot. Have you heard from uh, the, the campaigns or from CNN or ABC to ask your, uh, your plausibility of being on that debate stage? We are in discussions with CNN. CNN published a list of criteria, four criteria for, for candidates getting in the debate. And we have shown CNN that we meet all of those criteria and that President Trump and President Biden cannot meet those criteria. Despite RFK Jr. being the leading third party candidate and surpassing the criteria for inclusion in the presidential debates, the Uniparty prevents any challengers from participating in debates to avoid scrutiny of their policies, which have contributed to the United States' $35 trillion debt and its reputation as a perpetual war state. What the Washington Post reported is that Biden, in his negotiation, that President Biden and President Trump in their negotiations with CNN said to CNN, you need to have criteria that keep Kennedy off the stage. We don't want to be on the stage with them. CNN conceded to that. This is an addition to mass deployment of behavioral modification AI used on the public to ensure they remain the only two choices for president. These two tactics effectively silence dissenting voices like RFK Jr and other third-party candidates, maintaining the uniparty stranglehold on the nation. However, there is a growing movement advocating for a new voting system to reclaim power from the uniparty. Uh, I'm going to suggest that what's going wrong with American politics is born of poor and perverse incentives that are related to a design flaw. Now, this design flaw can happily be addressed at only 2% of the cost of how much the two major parties are going to pour into this presidential cycle. This is, to me, the highest leverage opportunity in the world to start solving some of our biggest problems. What is the approval rating of U.S. Congress as we're here together? And feel free to shout out a number even if you are not American. I'm anchoring you low so you know it's low. I'm hearing 30, I'm hearing 20. It is lower still, it is 15%. It's been declining a bit, it's been in the 20s, now it's around 15%. What is the re-election rate for incumbent members of the House of Representatives? Anchoring you high, you know it's high. It's higher still, it's 94%. That's a higher win rate than the Michael Jordan era Chicago Bulls, the Kevin Durant era Golden State Warriors. So what people imagine is that our leaders have to make 51% of us happy in order to stay in office. The truth is that only about 10 to 12% of voters participate in these primaries. And these voters tend to include some of the most ideological uh, or extreme of the bases of these parties. I have met many base voters, and let me just say they have, let's call them specific points of view. So how can you lose your job in this system if you essentially cannot lose the general election? So the fiction that most Americans have been told is, look, our leaders have to make 51% of us happy. The reality is that they have to stay on the good side of approximately 10% of their party's base voters. So this tends to bring people a bit to the sides. It changes their incentives. This is one reason why America's political parties feel like they're not listening to a lot of the public. So you have the party primaries that are stretching us toward the extremes. Then you have our media organizations that are separating us into tribes and teams. You know which teams media you're watching at any moment. And then you have social media pouring gasoline on the whole thing. What happens if some brave legislators lean across the aisle and try to compromise and find a solution to a big, hairy problem? 
They worked with the enemy, they're ideologically impure, their base turns on them, and their job security goes down. What happens if they let the problem linger and fester? Nothing. They can raise money, they can get votes, they can get you mad, and they have a 94% re-election rate. So you can put any major problem in this bucket, and this is why it feels like we're not making meaningful progress. You could put immigration in there, you could put climate change in there, you could put AI in there, you could put poverty in there. So Alaska in 2020 changed its primary process to make it so that candidates run in one primary from any party, and then the winner is chosen via ranked choice voting. This is an Alaskan ballot, and you can choose up to four candidates, first, second, third, fourth choice. Uh, I'm going to take a couple minutes just to review for the non-Americans and maybe some Americans here how the primary process ordinarily works. <laughs> so the way it works is that you have people running in each party, you have nominees who are chosen, and then the nominees run against each other, and the party that is dominant in that district wins. And as we saw, in 90% of the districts, you know which party is going to win that general election. In this new system in Alaska that was changed in 2020, now you have the top four candidates of any party get through to the general election, and then they are chosen via ranked choice voting. Oh. Senator Lisa Murkowski was up for re-election. And Senator Lisa Murkowski has the distinction of being the only Republican senator who voted to impeach Donald Trump, who was up for re-election. After her impeachment vote, her favorability rating was measured at 6% among Alaskan Republicans. They did not like that impeachment vote. But there is no party primary in Alaska anymore. So she went through essentially to the general, and she ended up emerging as the winner because she was, again, the second choice of a critical number of voters. So this change in Alaska had profound effects within two years and it cost $6 million to adopt this reform campaign. $6 million, you know how much the two parties are going to spend this presidential cycle? $10 billion. I'm going to suggest that this $6 million is the highest impact investment any of us has ever seen, and it's evergreen. It turns out that 25 states have ballot initiative measures where you could change the primaries into this new nonpartisan primary and ranked choice voting combination that ends up realigning the incentives away from the extremes and toward the public. Nevada voted to approve the Alaska system in 2022. That campaign cost a little bit more, it cost $22 million, but the advertisement that I thought put it over the top was a military veteran looking at the camera and saying, I went overseas to defend our country for years, I came back, and as an independent, I can't vote in our primaries. And I don't think that's right. 53% of Nevadans agreed with that veteran, even though both major parties came out against it. And in November, there are five more states that are considering a version of these reforms. I want you all to imagine six, eight, 10 US senators who are all of a sudden freed of their party primary and a similar number of members of Congress. Do you think that would meaningfully rationalize American politics and change them for the better? That is the vision that is on the table right now. And the cost of this, if you were to, to adopt these reforms and try them in 10 states, not all of them would pass, maybe half of them would pass, but the total cost would be about $200 million, which is only 2% of the $10 billion that are going to be spent turning Americans against each other, making us hate and fear each other over the next number of months. As we enter the age of AI with a uniparty techno-fascist government, Will we continue to allow tech giants born out of the intelligence community to run behavioral modification AI to control the masses to maintain this duopoly facade of a democracy? In our time, surveillance capitalism claims private human experience for the market dynamic as a free source of raw material that is translated into behavioral data these data are then combined with advanced computational abilities to create predictions, predictions of what we will do, predictions of our behavior, predictions of what we will do now, soon, and later. Or will we sit idle as champions of the people are shut out of the process by the Uniparty well, we are just about three weeks away from the first presidential debate. Um, but that debate will only feature two candidates, obviously, President Biden 
former President Donald Trump. But the third candidate running for president, uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., uh, not scheduled to be a part of that debate. Which not, is not invited. Not invited, and in fact, uh, he is using the word collusion uh, to describe what went down between uh, President Biden's campaign and Donald Trump's campaign and CNN, which is, uh, which is airing this debate. RFK Jr. fighting to get on the debate stage. What are your thoughts on that? Whether you agree with Bobby Kennedy or not really is not the issue. The issue is whether or not you believe in democracy. Could you imagine a primary like a debate between Biden and RFK. Let RFK go. Let him go on TV. Imagine RFK telling the truth about certain issues. RFK explaining how these systems work. RFK saying things where people accuse him. People have accused you of this. What is your answer? Let him say that on national television and people go, oh, wait a minute. What is he saying? What's going on here? And then, like, I like that guy better, and he's a Kennedy, right? And, and next, and he's a Democrat, lifelong Democrat, and he's like, he's like a reasonable sort of centrist character. Hold on, that's our guy. That's our guy, and people would vote for him, and they didn't want. Let's hope we embrace new schools of thought to restore our republic and regulate monoliths born out of the intelligentsia that seek to control the subconscious of the masses for the illusion of choice. The polarization, which is more toxic now in this country than any time since the American Civil War and poisonous and destructive, and it's all amplified by social media algorithms and nobody even understands how they're working anymore. But they're all designed to pour concrete on that polarization and divide us farther and farther until we go into civil war. Somebody's got to step in the middle and say, yeah, I'm not going And neither of them can do it because they're both the products of the polarization. They're both telling us to hate the other guy and hate the other side. If we're not vigilant, this highly scientific behavioral modification AI that literally can guarantee your purchases, next moves, and even elections could, in theory, be weaponized to divide the country into an actual civil war. That would allow a deep state who is 35 trillion in debt, starting forever wars to launder money while wiping their feet on the Bill of Rights, could then use this engineered splintering to rewrite the Constitution as they see fit when the dust has settled and the country comes back together. Creating a much different America. This is going to sound a little bit crazy, but I think the, the free speech debate is a complete distraction right now. I think the real debate should be about, about free will. And we, we feel it right now because we are being programmed. We're being programmed based on what we say we're interested in. And we are told uh, through these discovery mechanisms what is interesting, and as we engage and interact with this content, the algorithm continues to build more and more of this bias. But the algorithm, even if it's open source, is effectively a black box. You cannot predict 100% uh, of the time how it's going to work, what it's going to show you. And it can be moved and changed at any time. And, be and because people become so dependent upon it, it's actually changing and impacting the, the agency we have, the free agency we have. And I think the only answer to this is not to work harder at open source in algorithms or making them more explainable about what they're doing and why they're doing it, but to give people choice.